Yeah, welcome to my session. Thanks for coming. Um, and welcome to my talk, Back to the Future Time Travel with Bitemporal Databases. So, which problem do we want to solve here? What am I explaining to you and uh, how can you benefit from that? And the problem we wanted to solve in a project I was participating in was we didn't want to break the law, which is in most cases a good uh, intent. So the scenario, um, I was working as a contracting architect, software architect for a big shipping company in Hamburg that no longer exists. Uh, not because of our project or me. <laughs> and um, we developed an application which created bills of lading. If you're not familiar with that term, a bill of lading is uh, for one shipment, an itemized list containing information about all the contents of the shipment and some metadata of the shipment. So um, which, um, which container is the, are the goods in? Um, what kind of container is this? Is this a reefer container which needs to be cooled because there's some perishable goods in there? Um, what are the goods? Are they dangerous goods? If so, which uh, chemicals are in there? Which um, labels for dangerous goods do we need? Everything uh, from one shipment has to be tracked on this bill of lading. So it's basically an inventory about of the shipment which you can use to uh, track the shipment or to register the shipment with tax offices in all of the countries. Our application also needed to recreate builds of lading from the past. So if you are sending a big container ship to, I don't know, Saudi Arabia or Shanghai, um, and there are some disputes or legal issues, and the, those container ship was on the on the road or on its way for some time, then you need to be able to recreate the bill of lading from the system again to um, yeah, re-hand it to the authorities. And it would be nice if there are errors on it, if you can explain why this data is on that bill of lading. So where did the error come from? Also, we worked with data that had a limited validity. One example is the name of a vessel. So the name of a container ship was um, changing quite a lot. So not every week, obviously, also not every year. But it happened from time to time that the container ships of that company got a new name. Um, under seafarers might tell you that this brings bad luck, uh, but they did it anyways. So our application needed to know which container ship had which name at which point in time. And uh, we tracked the validity of those values in a simple table. So we had a table vessel, which for our short example only contains the ID. Uh, ID. Obviously, there were some more columns in there. We had the vessel name table, which tracked an ISO number, a vessel name. So this is the column we are interested in, a foreign key to the vessel ID, and a valid from and a valid to column. For our simple use case in the beginning, this seemed to be enough for us. A quick look at example data. Um, we have um, a, a, a consecutive ID here. We don't really need that, but we had it. And the ISO number always stayed the same. But the vessel with the ID 1 was called MSC John from the beginning of 2022 to the end of 2023. The current value would be MSC James for the entire year of 2024. And in the future, we already know that in the beginning of 2025, the vessel will be renamed to MSC Harry. So if um, we have a happy new year, and at um, the very first minute of the new year, if somebody creates a bill of lading because that's what they want to do at uh, New Year's Eve, um, they will instantly get the new value. Our application can query that and um, pass in the new value without any delays or um, issues. The vessel names are not the only aspect um, with a limited validity. Um, the same goes for routes. So which routes are those ships taking? They are, have um, some fixed timetables often, and those change. Uh, country names, also an interesting topic. Um, the last one renaming 
that comes to my mind is uh, North Macedonia, which was called Macedonia before 2019, I believe. They had a dispute with the Greece government and renamed the country. Um, zip codes change really often. So zip codes and um, cities or villages or parts of cities is an M to N relationship and it gets realigned sometimes. Uh, relations of cities to regions or even relations of cities to countries. So all of the geographic data is not fixed in time and there is not one valid point which will be always valid, but it is uh, prone to change and we need to track those changes with similar measures as shown for the vessel before. The issue with this approach is there is only one truth about the valid times in our database. So we have seen this already. This is our truth. In this time frame, it was MSC John. In our current time frame, it is MSC James. And in the future, it will be called MSC Harry. This is our truth. Um, and one day, we got a message saying, due to a system error, we failed to inform you that the vessel was renamed last week. It was not exactly like that. This is a little fictional. But something similar happened. So, But the week before, we already created a bill of lading and send it out to the authorities and to the customer with the wrong name on it. So nothing we could do. No, um, nobody told us that the name of the vessel changed. And it was not our problem to mitigate the damage done. So there were processes in the company. It was no problem for us. But there was a discussion in our project how we should handle that data change. We had two possible solutions to correct this mistake. We could fix the valid time in the database, but if we try to recreate this bill of lading in the future, then we will have the new vessel name on the bill of lading. So the bill of lading would not be the same as the one that was initially created, because we retroactively changed the validity of that vessel's name. The other way of doing it would be not fixing the valid time and saying, okay, Nobody told us that, so we just keep everything in the database as is. But if we create any other documents, any different documents, not bill of ladings or um, some reports or something like this, then we will keep sending out that wrong data. So not correcting the data is obviously also not ideal. And to handle this, we needed another time access in the database. So this was the scenario, the background, why I started um, looking into biotemporal databases. And um, now in the part two, I will take a look at the concepts, try to um, establish some terms. Um, and we will do that with a lot of SQL examples. Nobody running out, that's good. Um, all examples in this part are written for PostgreSQL um, because I'm quite familiar with it. Um, I was able to produce those examples with it quite easily. Um, this will change in another part, but we will see that. The first term is the valid time. I already used that uh, sometimes, I believe. Um, this defines which values are valid at which time. One time access, the valid time. So I'm showing this table for the third time now. Valid time is this concept we already talked about. We had that in our database. If we want to create a table with a valid time, the statement would look like this. Um, we have an ID with a primary key. Again, we don't need that, but we have it. We have the ISO number, the vessel name, the vessel ID. And we have two timestamp fields, valid from and valid to. Um, we had this table up front because we knew we need valid times, so um, that was not a big issue for us. But there are two issues with this approach. The first one is, if we want to avoid having overlapping time frames for the same vessel, we need to add triggers into the database. There is no table level constraint saying that the date ranges between those rows must not overlap. Overlapping date ranges um, would be horrible for us, because if we query the database and uh, ask it, what is the current name of the ship, and the database returns two names, we don't know what to do. So there's no mitigation for that. We cannot make an uh, automated error handling for this. So this would be an exception which is not really handleable. So having those constraints is 
important, but implementing those constraints is not that easy. Also, selecting the current value is a little bit more complex than just querying select asterisk from vessel, because we need to consider the factor time for every single query. So we have here an example. We select the ID, the ISO number, and the vessel name from the table vessel. We join the table vessel name on it, but we only want records where now is between valid from and valid to. So this is the minimum query we need to get the current value, the current name for our vessel. Um, we decided to create views for this. So we had a view where we also knew if we select against this view, we will get the currently valid values. Um, if you start joining them, if you join multiple tables and you want the valid value from every one of those tables, then it gets bigger and bigger and the query logic gets more complex. So obviously this is not a really complex query. It's readable. Most people will understand it, I'm sure. Um, but it is an annoyance. You need to put that everywhere. So valid time, first concept. The second concept is the transaction time. The transaction time defines which values were written, updated, or deleted at a certain time. So I want to be able to ask the database, what did my data look like two weeks ago, a year ago, a hundred years ago, depending on how long the system is running. Um, we will build that by hand for now, because um, PostgreSQL does not have any really well-designed features for bi-temporal data storage or transaction time. There are some extensions, um, but um, I like building things by hand to understand the concepts. So you're caught with me here to do the same. We are ignoring the valid time for now and just concentrating on the transaction time. Um, and we don't see it in this table here. We have just a table with the ID, the ISO number, and the vessel name. The, to track the history, we need to create an audit table in this case. We call that vessel audit. It has an ID, no primary key here. Um, so in this table, ID is a primary key. On this table, is it, it is not. We also have the ISO number and the vessel name. And we have a column created at and a column operation. Now, how can we fill the audit table? Um, there's a lot of discussions about this. Um, I'm from the Java world, mainly. There is a very, I almost said popular, but not many people like it. There's a, um, a popular framework um, for uh, OR mapping, JPA, or with Hibernate. I personally like it. People who don't like it probably have their reasons. Um, and it has a feature that's called Hibernate Inverse, which creates such audit tables and uh, duplicates the data on the client side. So every time you do an insert, the framework realizes that and inserts into the audit table from the client side. We didn't really like that because we couple ourselves to that implementation, to that um, persistence provider. So we decided we let the database take care of that. So we created a trigger. Um, in Postgres, this looks like this. Um, we are creating a function, which returns a trigger. And um, if the trigger operation is insert, then we insert into the vessel audit table all the values from new. This is uh, um, an implicit variable containing the new values to be inserted into the table. And we add the current timestamp and the operation inserted to it. Those are the last two columns. In production, I would not recommend doing this with new dot asterisk because it's a little shaky. I would just use the field list. Um, this is just to keep this slide a little shorter because it barely fits the code on the slide. Um, and if the operation is an update, we do the same, but the operation name is updated. And if the operation is a delete, then um, we put the value deleted in the audit table row, and we put the old values in the table, because there are no new values. It's deleted. There's no new. And after that, we create a trigger uh, on the table uh, vessel after insert or update or delete. 
And for each updated, inserted, or deleted row, we execute the procedure process vessel after. So every time we insert into the vessel table, we are creating an audit row in the audit table. This has the benefit that we can use the table vessel just like a normal table, because it is a normal table. So we can insert into it, we can update it, and we can delete from it. So we are inserting the name MSC Johan for the vessel name, we are updating it to MSC Rüdiger, and in the end, we delete the vessel because, I don't know, it was sunk or decommissioned. The audit table then looks like this. Um, the ID is always the same because it, re it references the primary key from our vessel table. And now we know why I had to remove the primary key for this table. The ISO number always stayed the same. And at uh, 12.05, we inserted the name MSD Johan on June 23. On the 1st January of 2024, we updated the name to MSC Rüdiger. And on the 9th June of 24, so yesterday, we deleted the ship entirely from the database. Um, this is nice to create an audit log, but Again, here, there are two issues. The first issue is the historic data is now in a different table. Um, it is disputable if this is an issue, because on the pro side, um, if the historic data is not located with the live data, this makes querying and updating the live data much faster. We don't have this whole ball of data in one place. Um, so it might be a good thing. From the querying side, it's a bad thing, because um, I can't just seamlessly blend from the latest version to the, um, to the historic version. I need to change tables, maybe. So the historic data is not that easy to query. If you can imagine you wanted to get uh, the current value from here, um, yeah, you need to consider the operation, right? If you only take the latest value, then and it is deleted, then your application logic must handle it at, as there is no record. Um, if you look back further and you get an updated or inserted, you can just take that value, but you need even more complex query logic, which is a little sad. So we have learned about the valid time and the transaction time, and now um, for the term Bitemporal, because we're 20 minutes into the talk and I have not explained the word from the title yet. A bitemporal database tracks two axes of time. So in our case, it tracks the valid time and the transaction time at once. So for example, we want to combine the valid from and valid to columns we have created in the first example and the audit table we created in the second example. I won't show the DDL scripts for that because it's just both combined, and it wouldn't fit the slide, I tried. But the ER diagram looks like this. We have our vessel table, we have the vessel name table with the relationship, which tracks the valid time, and our audit table now tracks valid from and valid to, and created at, and the operation. So we have the current valid time in the vessel name table, we can always just query it for to get the current valid time or the past or future valid times. We have the trans transaction time in the vessel name audit and the valid time per transaction time in the vessel name audit too. So again, this is just some kind of um, event lock if you want. So it's not easy again to query this from this table, but the information is there and we could um, query the valid times we assumed to be true at some certain point in time even if we change that retroactively. In the data, it looks like this. Um, so this is the audit table. And it, the rows created at June 23 and January 24 assumed that the ship was called MSC Danielle from the beginning of 22 to the end of 23, and that it was called MSC Roberta from the beginning of 24 until the end of time, which is 
I hope this is not the end of time, but we used it because we assumed that our application would not live for 7,000 years. Um, but on the 9th of June, so yesterday, we updated those rows and said, no, 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 um, MSC Danielle was the name until end of August 23. So we retroactively changed the value. And from the beginning of September, it was actually called MSC Roberta. If we now wanted to recreate this bill of lading, we could do this with this information, which is still in the database. And if we want to get the current, currently valid values, we could use uh, the recent transaction time values to query this information. Are you with me until here? Okay, that's good. Um, I already stated that querying this data is a lot of effort. Um, also, creating and maintaining this structure is also a lot of effort. So, um, for the simplest um, use case, we had the vessel table. If we want to have the validity, we add the vessel audit, uh, the vessel name table. Then we have an audit table we create additionally. Um, we have a, a stored procedure. We have a trigger. And um, if we want a way to always query the current valid value, then we also start creating views. So we are creating a lot of objects in the database we have to maintain. And if you start um, adding or removing columns to and from those tables, then you have to change the trigger, uh, the procedure, and the audit table also. So it adds a lot of maintaining maintenance overhead. And it is quite an expensive feature to run and support. Also, I'm not that comfortable in my Postgres SQL know-how to not know that I may have messed up the trigger or the stored procedure anywhere. And from the most back-end development teams, um, I would say that most Java developers I know don't feel as comfortable in SQL also. So my, my statement is not Java developers can't write SQL. So, um, But maybe not on that level, or may, many are not that comfortable with that level. Luckily, there is something called the SQL standard. Um, I joked online last week that uh, so many vendors are ignoring or, or bending it that it could be, should be called the SQL suggestions instead. Um, but there is a standardizing body. And uh, they thought about those temporal features too and realized um, that it is a very um, useful tool to have and they tried standardizing it. Um, I'm saying in the SQL 2011 standard, obviously it's also um, a part of the later SQL standards, but it was introduced in SQL 2011. And if you want to search for that, um, add the 2011 um, standard to it, because then you will get all the blog posts, what's new in SQL 2011. We are switching databases because Postgres SQL does not support the temporal features from SQL 2011. Um, not many relational databases do, unfortunately. So MariaDB um, handles that and can use it. Um, also, I think IBM DB2 um, has implemented it quite, uh, quite far or even completed. Um, Oracle are making their own thing like always. And for Postgres, there are extensions, but they are not really um, um, catering to the standard. So it is just a different handling for Postgres also. The first thing, first thing um, we can see in the SQL 2011 standard is that it supports valid time. So on the first look, this table is really um, looking familiar to us. We already had all of those columns in my homebrew handwritten solution. But here we have a new uh, statement, period for, date period, valid from, and valid to. And this is telling the database system that um, we want to create a date period in this table. This is a name, so this can be chosen freely. We call this date period date period. And it um, is described by the fields valid from and valid to. The first thing this does is making sure that the valid to value is also later than the valid from value. So if you insert valid from 2024 and valid to 2023, on insert, the database will pre uh, prevent you from creating that record. There's a first constraint on that, which helps us. 
But still, you might say, okay, how is this different from our example? We still have to create the valid from and valid to column, and we have to maintain it. And we have to manually fill it, and we have to query for this. Um, this helps us because now we can create a constraint on the valid time um, with a statement. Oh, this highlight should be one line more up. Um, unique key on vessel ID and on the date period. So I don't need to include valid from and or valid to into the unique key without overlaps. And this makes sure that the valid from and valid to uh, validities we enter into the table for each vessel ID may not overlap. So we cannot create that a bad situation that we have two valid names for one vessel at one point in time. This is uh, an insertion check, and this will prevent us from inserting this. So this helps us quite a lot in maintaining our data integrity. Let's add some data to that table. Uh, we insert into vessel name the values. Uh, this is the um, the vessel uh, code, the name, the vessel ID for our foreign ref reference from 2022 to the end of 23. It is called MSC Danielle. And as we had in our example, from 2024 on, it will be called MSC Roberta. Now we have two rows in the table. So if we do a select asterisk from vessel name, we will get both rows, and we will still have to filter from, for the valid from and valid two times. Um, as we had before, so we still need our view. But there's some other benefits. We can delete whole data ranges by referencing our date period. So we want to delete all of the information from May 22 to the mid of June 22. Let me skip back to the two rows. This is from the beginning of 2022 to the end of 23, and we want to delete a slice in the middle of that time frame. Before we had two rows. Do we want to guess how many rows we will have after that deletion? Three. I have seen three fingers. We will have three, because the database knows this is a, per a period, and it will end the row we had. Uh, earlier, so this validity will end at May 22, and it will append a new row, and from June 15th to the end of 2023, it will also be valid. So it split our validity time frame into two time frames, left a hole in the middle, and from for, for uh, the whole May and half of June, there was no valid name for that vessel anymore. Um, if you want to do that by hand, you can obviously do that too. So you have to uh, select the data, you have to um, apply some logic to it, you recreate a new row, you cut the first one, you set the valid, valid times for the other one, you can do all of that in one transaction. But this is really handy and really helpful. You can also do this with updates on date ranges. So instead of delete for a period, you can also do an update, um, which will have a similar effect. You can adjust, um, I don't know, set a different status in the database, you can uh, recalculate the name based on other data in the row. Um, I don't have an example for that because this would uh, make us run out of time. Um, but the MariaDB documentation is really well written on that and um, really helpful. Okay, those are the features um, which are implemented by MariaDB in accordance to the SQL 2011 standard, which makes us help work with date ranges and validity. This helps us a little bit, mainly with data integrity and some um, yeah, quality of life features. Um, what is really nice is the MariaDB support for transaction time. If we want to track the transaction time of a table, we just have to add the statement with system versioning to the end of the DDL script. You can also do this after creating a table with an update statement, so you can add system version versioning to an existing table. You can also remove system versioning from a table with um, an update clause. Um, but this is everything we have to do on the DDL side to make uh, enable system versioning for that table. So here I'm setting the global uh, the session timestamp to the beginning of 2022 to simulate 
that we have written those SQL statements in 2022. Um, if you don't do that, the transaction time is your local server time. And um, we insert all the data we already know, MSC Danielle until the end of 23, MSC Roberta until uh, the end of time. And then we jump forward to the beginning of 2024, and then we add our new information, that the vessel name for the first name entry was only valid until end of August 23, and the vessel name for the second name entry is actually valid since September 23. So that retroactive change we already did. If we now query the table without any parameters limiting the transaction time, we only get the current version, right? We don't see the, uh, the historic version. We only get the currently valid version with the new fields we updated at the beginning of 2024. If we want to have the version before that, we can query for system time as of timestamp, and this is the transaction time we are interested in, and then we get the state of the data in the table as of uh, New Year's Eve, on in 2023, and we get the old values. So we can get rid of the whole audit table and create a trigger and create a stored procedure and copy that over stuff. And this is really, really more convenient um, than the th solution we built before. We can also query for system time all. Then we get all of the data and all of the validities. Um, now there's no way to see what the transaction time was at that time. For that, we can add the um, implicit rows, row start and row end. They will be part of a table that is system version. We did not create them on our own. MariaDB did that for us. And then we can have the validity of the transaction time and the span. And then we can do a lot of fun analysis with that data. So this makes querying the past much, much easier. Um, from the top of my head, MariaDB and IBM DB2 support this. Other databases, not so much, but there are a lot of databases now, so um, I don't know all of them. Um, I just want to sh briefly mention three databases I have worked with. Um, I first had contacts with biotemporal databases with Dat Datomic and XTDB. They are a little niche. They are very well known and used in the Clojure community because they have great Clojure APIs, and um, they, uh, Datomic is from the creator of Clojure. XTDB is a very, very nice open source version. Or Datomic was not open source for a long time, and uh, XTDB has similar concepts, but is open source. Um, Datomic is a data log database with ASA transactions and built-in history. XTDB is also fully bitemporal and has support for data log. And from version 2 on, which will be released in some time now, uh, it also has SQL support and full SQL 2011 standard compatibility. This is a very interesting product. Um, and there's also a database written in Java, CyrixDB. It's a bitemporal append-only database system and event store. This is document-based, so if this is more interesting to you, maybe take a look there. So, um, a short summary and a short list of use cases. Building temporal features on your own can get expensive, meaning developer time and time you need to maintain this. Also, if you build it on your own and the database is not optimized, you might create very slow queries and um, yeah, just drag some ball on your leg for the rest of your project. I'm not sure if we really want to build and maintain this. So um, the systems implementing the temporal features help us a lot, and I would recommend if you have those features in your application, you should take a look at the database systems sup that support this out of the box. But even if you use a product which can make use of bitemporal history, um, there is still an organizational overhead and increased demand for storage, which is quite logical, right? If we keep the history, we need to store it somewhere. Um, that's a neat point in MariaDB. Um, you can partition the history um, differently than the live data. So by default, the history and the live data is in the same storage space in the database. But if you don't want that, you can uh, partition by history. And then you have the history on a different partition, and uh, the data database um, can access the live tables a little easier and faster. 
So use cases for a valid time only. Uh, memberships. A membership, your gym membership is only valid from one point in time to another. Same goes for the employment status. You're not employed indefinitely. Um, at least at some point you might want to retire. So this is something you can track with valid time. You don't need to combine this, right? You don't need to have bitemporal storage. All of the time we can also have unitemporal systems. I already mentioned geographic data. Um, names change, um, relationships from cities to countries to regions to zip codes change. Um, we don't really want to have that hard coded in our system. And we have use cases that benefit only from transaction time. For example, financial data. What was my amount on my bank account two weeks ago? Um, could be, um, you, you could implement that with a system version table. Uh, you could also do um, an event-based system, of course. But if you have a relational database and that's what you want to use, um, you can do this with system version tables. Time tracking at work. Um, of course, we have written our own time tracking application for our company. And we are using XTDB uh, for time tracking. So we have an audit log and know what the state of the system was in any given point of time. And this did all, um, cost us almost no overhead. And everything connected to legal requirements. So every time the state asks you what was the state of your system, what was the data you had at this point in time, system version tables can help you to achieve this. By temporal data, um, are all of those use cases if you combine them. So for example, a payroll. Um, from, which, um, from which point in time to which other point in time do I earn the money I earn right now? And what did the system think I earned two weeks ago or three years ago? That's an information maybe the tax office might be very interested in. And to circle back to my initial example, every time you want to reproduce documents, um, every time you need to reproduce the exact data you had at a, in the system at a certain point in time, this is also a use case for bitemporal data. Uh, two last uh, uh, comments, or three last comments. It is really hard to retroactively fit bitemporality into an existing system. So before creating a new application, a new use case, you should plan accordingly. But also, simplicity wins. Don't implement bitemporal databases because you might just in case need it later. Um, that's a lot of overhead you add to your system without any need. Um, so don't start going to your application tomorrow and just change all those parameters and start tracking the history now. Although it's very good to know the tools and have them in your tool belt, I did not know the tools when I was working in that logistics project and we had to implement everything by hand in Oracle DB which was not that fun, uh, but made sure that the project didn't let me go because I was the one creating and documenting it and nobody else wanted to touch it. I have on the, this slide some interesting links. Uh, the slides are already shared with the conference and I will share them on LinkedIn and Mastodon after this talk. Um, a very good summary on the temporal features in SQL 2011 can be found in this essay. There's an exceptionally well-written article by Martin Fowler on bitemporal history. And uh, the MariaDB blog has a five-part series on the temporal tables and temporal features, um, which was also a great read. Thank you for listening. And we have one minute for questions left. <laughs> Thank you very much. So any question? So thank you, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, just one question, uh, have you tried this PostgreSQL extension? Uh, because from my experience, uh, well, uh, PostgreSQL is built uh, to, uh, well, to work well with extensions, and mm -hmm. usually there are no issues. So uh, I'm yes. just to ask if there is. Yeah. So um, this might have come, um, come off wrongly. The extension does what it promises to do, and it works, but it is not adhering to the SQL standard. It's a different syntax and a, diff and a different approach. Thank you. Um, I had a 
thought with your first example with the ships that were being renamed mm -hmm. and you always said valid from uh, to valid to and one of the um, classifiers I would have expected like you said of course those times cannot overlap mm -hmm. um, but also a ship doesn't cease to exist and then come back into existence so I would have thought there's a rule that the valid to always has to have a corresponding valid from Mm -hmm. Unless the ship was, you know, decommissioned. Yes. And so I was thinking, you know, obviously uh, with the SQL features that were introduced in the standard, they also expect a valid from and valid to, and which makes sense if you think of like memberships, which mm -hmm. do cease to exist. But when you were implementing it by hand, I think I would have just dropped the valid to and just always taken the last valid from that's before my date. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you consider this at all? Were there reasons you didn't go with this? Um, it was discussed, um, but it would have made the query a little harder because you cannot just um, get the validity from one row. You need to consider the next row in line. Um, and it was just the general discussion that we opted to make the queries easier um, while having the risk to have a gap. So, I guess we are running out of time. So, thank you again. Thank you. And. Thank you.